Welcome to Healthcare Data Analytics, Data Analytics in Clinical Settings. This is Lecture B. The component, Healthcare Data Analytics, covers the topic of healthcare data analytics, which applies the use of data, statistical and quantitative analysis, and explanatory and predictive models to drive decisions and actions in healthcare. The learning objectives for data analytics in clinical settings are to describe the current state of data analytics in clinical settings, identify key tools and approaches to improve analytics capabilities in clinical settings, describe different governance and operation strategies in analytics in clinical settings, discuss value-based payment systems and the role of data analytics in achieving their potential, and analyze data used in population management and value-based care systems. In this lecture, we'll provide some examples of how to address the complex issues related to data and measurement for data analytics in clinical settings. First, we'll describe a case where data is diverse and fragmented, and how data needs to be integrated to perform effective analysis. Then, we'll describe the importance of using detailed measure specifications and standard measures to ensure that your analytics are predicting what is important and related to broader health and healthcare goals. This messy diagram is intended to show the information flow as Ms. Fiera, a person with five complex chronic conditions, interacts with the healthcare system over the course of one year. If we were to estimate outcomes for her, we would find that she has 90 times the rate of hospitalizations as someone with no chronic conditions, that she takes on average 14 medications, and that she'll see 12 specialists during that one year. How can analytics help us measure her risks and whether her care is of high quality and safe? Where does the system break down when we're trying to measure the quality of her care and predict her needs? First, the more interaction with the healthcare system she has, the more likely her data is to be fragmented. Often, when someone is hospitalized, the hospital's information system is not the same as the outpatient system, so the information about her previous care is not available to the hospital. And if the hospital changes two drugs, then the primary care setting may not get a notification about that. In fact, the primary care setting may never know she's in the hospital. The only complete source of data about her healthcare utilization may be in the bills that go to health insurance companies or the federal government for Medicare. These bills are stored in so-called claims databases and are not integrated back to EHRs in most cases. This can cause serious problems as we try to analyze data to understand Ms. Fiera's care and health outcomes. Let's explore this data measurement issue in a different way, by data sets. EHR data, in our example, is stored by the primary care providers. It has a longitudinal record of all the data collected at the clinic and associated laboratory. This information can be useful in analysis when ongoing patient factors are needed. For instance, when we are predicting risk of readmissions, comorbidities are helpful to understand if the patient's health is complicated by multiple other diseases. The claims data, which are the set of bills for healthcare, may contain other equally important information. Information about ED visits, the acuity of the hospitalization, and final diagnoses may only be available through these claims, since the hospital may be on a different system. Finally, other data, usually not stored in either the EHR or the claims data, may be helpful, such as social, behavioral, and environmental data. Environmental, in this case, means information about where people live. The availability of healthy food, for instance, may be low in certain urban settings. The lack of integration of this data leads to poor prediction in healthcare settings, and Ms. Vieira may be readmitted because the system did not adapt. It is possible, however, to integrate data from these sources, or at least exchange it, as in health information exchange programs. To truly analyze risk, the data can be integrated into an analytic data warehouse, where all relevant and available data can be processed. Then, a more accurate and complete risk score can be calculated, and programs like transitional care coaching or the care transitions intervention can be targeted to her needs. These programs can reduce readmission risk by working with patients more closely before and upon discharge. This is an ideal version. In the real world, there are still many issues to be dealt with. For instance, claims data often takes a long time to be available, 
sometimes more than a year. Quicker access to the information is needed in many cases, and so communities may exchange information electronically. Similarly, data that means the same thing is not stored in the same way across settings. We must strive for semantic interoperability, where we can recognize when things mean the same thing. Finally, we have the issue that, even electronically, most data is stored as unstructured notes or reports, which makes it difficult to predict issues. Another kind of data that is increasingly important, but is not integrated, is genomic data. We have rapidly increased our ability to process genomic information, but we can't exchange it easily, and it's not integrated into most analytic or healthcare systems. The Implementing Genomics in Practice, or IGNITE, network was funded by the National Institutes of Health to improve the integration of this data. Shown are the more than a dozen sites involved in the network. Two examples are given from the network. Mount Sinai in New York is looking at why African Americans with hypertension have more kidney failure or end-stage renal disease. They found that particular alleles from the APOL1 locus vary by race and may help predict risk and provide insight into different approaches to treatment. Similarly, Indiana is using what we know about how people process drugs based on their genetics, known as pharmacogenomics to help people pick both the right drugs and the right doses to avoid costly complications. The IGNITE network wants to see if providing this information reduces overall healthcare costs. Data about where a person lives and how they live can be more important than the healthcare they receive in many cases. For instance, your day-to-day -day behaviors, such as how much you walk or what you eat, may affect your risk of hospitalization from heart failure more than medications or healthcare. Similarly, the walkability of your neighborhood and availability of healthy foods may also affect your health more than particular treatments or procedures. We have not previously had good ways to integrate this data into health and healthcare, but that's changing as people recognize this data's value. Similarly, the outcomes they perceive, such as the amount of pain they feel or the things they can do, are more important than many lab tests or other study results. There are a number of new standards and methods to record and integrate information about patient outcomes and environmental data. For instance, patient-reported outcomes are stored and can be retrieved from a measurement information system known as PROMISE. This system provides structured, validated ways for patients to report on outcomes that may be important to them, such as their depression symptoms or their overall function for daily activities. Now let's think about measures of healthcare quality and how they help us to better analyze the care we deliver and the health it provides. Let's think about a particular person, Mr. Smythe. At 68 years old, he's out gardening in 2001 when suddenly he has chest pain. He's rushed to the hospital where the EKG, shown, is demonstrating ST wave elevations that definitely show something going on with his heart. With an echocardiogram that shows his heart is not pumping well, and with other ongoing symptoms, the medical team notes he's having an active heart attack. Many people assume that he'll get exactly the treatment he needs in the vast majority of cases. What evidence do we have about what are effective treatments for heart attack? And what about his congestive heart failure, where his heart can no longer pump efficiently enough to meet the needs of his body? There is very good evidence from a variety of clinical trials that he needs medications to limit the damage from the heart attack and improve the function of his heart. The medications are shown here, along with their related studies, and the reduction in deaths from effectively using them. Other treatments are important too, such as cardiac rehabilitation. With this number of life-saving treatments available, we anticipate he'll get the great care he needs. But to be sure, we must measure how well we did. Now, pause and think to yourself, how often would a patient like Mr. Smythe receive these treatments in 2001? How about more recently, in 2010? Or 2012? 100% of the time? 95% of the time? Perhaps 80%? In 2001, the answer is just a bit less than two-thirds of the time, 65% for ACE inhibitor use and 80% for beta blocker use. We've seen significant improvements over time, 
in part because people started to measure their rate of providing these medications and reporting them to each other and to various quality measurement programs. We can calculate an achievable benchmark of 95% for ACE inhibitor use, about 30% higher than when Mr. Smythe had his heart attack. And the benefit of this treatment is decreasing deaths. In 2000, about 10% of patients died in the hospital when they came in with a heart attack. Now it's just above 4%. These are the effects better quality measurement and better quality care can achieve. We haven't had the ability or drive to focus on analytics in the United States before, in part because we couldn't measure or change care effectively. Now, programs like accountable care organizations benefit from predicting what treatments are best for which patients and which may not be helpful or useful. To be effective, one must measure what will be analyzed carefully. Historically, one had to define the measures of interest based on the goals and related concepts, then define how to measure them through indicators which had to be defined, and then data was collected and analyzed. In each clinical setting, the information technology and informatics staff had to define their own metrics based on their available data and the goals of the project. This long list of steps would be needed to start to measure anything you wanted to analyze. Instead of a numbered list of steps to start measuring, many measurement definitions and specifications come from large collaboratives that define the measures for you based on evidence, feasibility, and expert input. Some measures for analysis will still be local, however, most of them come from these collaboratives. For instance, the Health and Human Services, or HHS, branch of the government uses a highly standardized set of definitions for their measures to pay for high-quality care or to reduce payments for certain care, such as when readmissions could have potentially been avoided. Philosophy is still important, however. Measuring quality of care feels very different to those being measured than fee-for-service medicine. That is, normally, a clinical team decides to provide a treatment or service and then bills for it. Quality measurement tries to measure whether that service would be recommended by the medical evidence and whether all services recommended were provided. Thus, establishing your measurement philosophy in a clinical setting is important. A key part of a good measurement philosophy is a culture that is felt to encourage learning, not judging, but that when people truly and repeatedly make errors, that there is justice in the way they are treated. Cultures of pathology blame the person solely and not the system of care, and bureaucracy forms committees without acting on the information directly. If you're starting an analytics effort, it's worthwhile to explore what you truly want to measure and then look at the specifications for yourself. The HHS measure inventory at AHRQ has a number of worthwhile measures. If we go to the site listed on the previous slide, this screenshot shows us how a search might lead to specific measures. Here, we've looked at admissions and readmissions for heart failure, as well as some of the medication measures we were discussing before. If you drill down into the measures, you can compare the reason for the measure, the detailed definitions, and even where else it's used. Here we see the rationale of one of the measures in the registry. It focuses on the detailed information about the measure. Note that this version of the measure has been withdrawn, but the link can show related measures. In this measure, they outline the reasons for admissions and readmissions and offer some suggestions on how people might use the measure. Some of the measures are now electronic clinical quality measures, or ECQMs. These require electronic data from clinical sources, such as EHRs. They have very specific sets of codes and logic that should be used. The Value Set Authority Center, or VSAC, allows you to drill down into these specifications. Here is the link to the VSAC. The following slides will show images of it. These images show the workflow of using the specifications. Here is shown an example of a measure definition component. These value sets have one or more codes that are important to the analysis of the measure. Here, a foot exam code, measured in the SNOMED CT taxonomy, is shown. In this value set, there's only one eligible code, so those wishing to report on this measure would need to map their workflow for a foot exam for patients with diabetes to this code to have it count as complete. Here is another example, the broad definition of diabetes used in several measures. Here, 173 codes from three different taxonomies may be used. 
there are a number of useful sources to check for measure specifications. There are many organizations that develop measures, and you can learn a great deal from looking at their websites to understand how they developed them and how they're intended to be used. For instance, the Commonwealth Fund has measures that compare healthcare systems across countries. These are helpful to understand how other countries with very different systems do in promoting healthy populations and meeting expectations of care. One example is the American Geriatric Society, focused on the needs of older adults. To find this article, point your web browser to the URL on the screen. When the National Quality Measures Clearinghouse site opens, type American Geriatric Society in the search box, then click the search button. Look for the item titled Geriatrics, Percentage of Female Patients Aged 65 Years and Older Who Were Assessed for the Presence or Absence of Urinary Incontinence Within 12 Months. This looks at whether female patients over 65 were assessed for involuntary urine loss or urinary incontinence. Is this a good measure? Look at the rationale and evidence. Sometimes, as in this measure, it requires additional reading to understand the purpose of the measure in healthcare. How do we know if measures are good? We can ask ourselves if they're important, as many of our heart failure measures were. Do they measure something that has a real and true effect on health and well-being? We can look at scientific acceptability. These mean that we're truly measuring what we mean to measure, also called validity, and that if we measure twice in the same situation, we get the same result, also called reliability. We also need people to understand the measure, use it, and be able to calculate the measures reasonably, also called feasibility. How do these strategies help jumpstart your analytics program? First, quality and safety measures may already need to be reported at your institution, and therefore you can leverage that infrastructure to select measures that relate to your analytic goals. It can also be more efficient in that it aligns efforts, reduces maintenance, and avoids duplicating work. Finally, the validation work done on the quality measures, if done at all, may help your analytics efforts be more effective. This concludes Lecture B of the Unit on Data Analytics in Clinical Settings. In summary, this lecture focused on how to jumpstart your analytics process by better integrating data, by using standard measures rather than making up your own, and by validating the measures you implement. These are very important tools and approaches to enhance your analytic processes.